Welcome everyone. Uh, we're here today to hear a lecture by Dr. Molly O'Neill, uh, who is uh, currently a Fulbright lecturer and researcher at Collegium Civitas in Warsaw. And the lecture will be about foreign policy, but uh, I'll tell Satan about Dr. O'Neill. Uh, she's here to research a very interesting topic, which is the Europeanization of Polish foreign policy, which is something very interesting at this very time. We had a very good conversation about this last week, and she has some great insights and some great stories. For example, when she went to the headquarters of the Club with Pravid Dibosnes for their program, and she was told that the program will be revealed after elections, which is interesting. However, today we'll not talk about this, although this is also very interesting, but we'll talk about um, foreign policy and elections, and although elections are usually not um, considered to be very much focused about foreign policy, foreign policy is important with candidates having different opinions and different experience and different plans. For example, Ben Carson, I think, had a plan to defeat ISIS and the plan was we had to find a way to make a fool out of them, which is a very concrete and interesting foreign policy plan. But there are also candidates like uh, Hillary Clinton, who obviously has a lot of experience and esteem in terms of foreign policy. Dr. O'Neill, before becoming a scholar, she was uh, in the American Foreign Service, so she was a diplomat. She worked, for example, in uh, in Tbilisi, in Tashkent, in Moscow, in Baku, so this Eastern, Eastern, um, and Asian, and Eastern European um, uh, area. Uh, after leaving the Foreign Service, she did her PhD in John Hopkins. Uh, she also worked at American University, so the places to go when it comes to American foreign policy uh, in America, in Washington. Now she's uh, she's working in Warsaw, researching Polish foreign policy. Um, and uh, and that's it. We'll hear about we'll hear a very interesting election, a lecture, and then please um, have a lot of interesting questions about this. Okay. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Now let's welcome Dr. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really very very pleased and honored to be here. I wanted to let you know that I, uh, although I did uh, have a career as a diplomat, I am no longer in any way official, and so what I'm going to say has nothing to do with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, do I, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. It's, it's nothing, just a precaution. Yeah, nothing to do, I mean, to say you should not interpret what I'm saying as anything like official or American foreign policy, but I think it's fair to say that those of us who do uh, have a career and interest in foreign policy, at least in the United States, are frequently uh, disappointed uh, with the level and the complexity and the, um, I don't know, the quality of the discussion about foreign policy in American, foreign, in American politics. And uh, so when uh, Piotr suggested I do something for, the cl for your class, it occurred to me immediately to think about how is foreign policy uh, figuring in the campaign. And uh, I think it must be important for you all, being I'm sure mostly Polish, but also from other countries as well, to think about what might be the implications of foreign policy changes that could happen with the different outcomes on the election. So <clears throat> that's the introduction. So the first thing I would say, I would like to try to answer uh, a few questions, some pretty obvious ones maybe. For example, is this election, this election, electoral contest, is it about foreign policy? And the answer to that is yes, but only partially. It's about, of course, many other things. And also, to the extent it is about foreign policy, it seems to be about um, foreign policy in quite a limited sense, and in particular, a sense that is related to the domestic security of Americans right now. And uh, you may be aware of that, I'll explain it further. What else is the election about? Well, uh, just as in Poland and every other democracy, it's about the economy and about how people's living standard is uh, going, how their hopes for educating their children and all those kinds of questions are very, very important. And then finally, this is sort of an elusive thing, but, oh, excuse me, I have a cold. I suppose you can hear my horrible <laughs> voice, but anyway. Finally, it's about leadership and character, these very elusive things. In America matters a great deal. It's just how the person seems. It's the person you have confidence in that he or she will make the right decision in crisis circumstance. So those are the things that matter. So will foreign policy differences, we're going to see there are foreign policy differences among the candidates, but will foreign policy differences 
de determine the outcome on the election? My answer to that is I think it's very unlikely. So it's very unlikely because so many other issues are important. So there will not be a clean uh, association between the um, part of policy position and the person's election. I, I don't think so. Because as I say, these other things matter too. Um, will the winner of the election change U.S. foreign policy? It's possible. It really depends on who will, will win. Well, probably it will change a little bit no matter who wins. But to change dramatically, it would depend on who is elected. So well, that's the introduction. So now let's look at some of the candidates. I think you know about these people. Oh, wait, Peter, why is this not working for me? Oh, it's a right click? Yeah, no, you can go back. This way? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, so <clears throat> this person is not running for office, as you all know. So, but the election, it, to some extent, is about him. Just like in every country, I guess, it's very common that you might propose, you might understand this election to some extent as an unspoken or undeclared referendum on the leadership of the previous president. So, what uh, Obama is one of the rare, President Obama is a rare case, I think, of a president whose election did depend quite a bit on foreign policy. Maybe not exclusively, but it depended a lot on foreign policy. Now, you probably know what I mean by that, right? Is that he was elected, to some extent, based upon his having recognized in very early uh, uh, time that the invasion of Iraq was a bad idea, and he voted against it in the Senate. So that was how he defeated Hillary Clinton last time around in the primaries, is because of that emphasis on his judgment about foreign policy. So it mattered a lot in that election. Now, what was his motto about foreign policy? I don't know if any of you ever heard this. It was a little bit of an expletive. I'm not going to give it to you specifically. But he didn't say this in public, but he was known to have said, what we're going to do is we're not going to do stupid stuff. OK, we're not going to do stupid stuff. So that was his plan. So when you look at, I mean, that's probably not his whole plan, but uh, that was a large part of it. So when you look at his successes then, the first thing I think you need to look at is, well, what didn't he do, okay? What didn't happen? Okay, first, these are like negative successes. So, first, there's no involvement of U.S. ground troops in Syria. He, I think, perceived that this was not going to be popular. But, if you want to be critical of it, you can say also there's no successful diplomatic solution in Syria, nor is there a prospect of one, uh, really, uh, very much. So that's one thing. And of course, we have the rise of ISIS. There's no uh, US military intervention in a, cons in a conventional sense uh, anywhere in the world. So that, he achieved that. Second, his uh, work against terrorism has been rather in the form of specific, more targeted uh, counterterrorism, air attack, and things of that nature, which have got uh, at least one can say that there has been no major uh, terrorist attack on U.S. soil in the eight years he's been president. That's a negative success. And finally, that the Iraq war, which he said he would end, the U.S. involvement there, it is ended, and there's a drawdown on, the, on Afghanistan, so a drawdown of U.S. troop forces in Afghanistan. So both of all these are the successes, or at least you could construe them as successes. Those are negative successes. On the positive success, in other words, things that were actually done, instead of mistakes that were avoided, I would say, first of all, I think you must all be aware right now, it's quite a bit in the news, is the uh, successful negotiation of the nuclear uh, deal with Iran. Okay, so um, this, I think, I think Obama himself has said that, you know, in the future, I'm going to be judged on whether this proves to be um, a lasting success. But it certainly, as a diplomatic achievement, it's quite remarkable. And it, especially in the context of U.S. domestic opinion, it was very, very uh, hard to achieve. So that was, that's one. And probably the other big one is climate change agreement, which was just confirmed, con completed in uh, Paris uh, recently. He started the, his, uh, his um, 
uh, his, a lot of his thinking about foreign policy also involved the notion that the U.S. should uh, make a so-called pivot to Asia. Have you, any, you heard this expression before? Pivot to China. In other words, recognizing that the, the global economy, global economic activity, and, and uh, therefore um, power really is shifting to East Asia, particularly to China, the U.S. should uh, direct more of its attention to that area to try to, uh, you know, uh, I, not contain China, but at least, you know, interact with uh, the countries in that region. So that, the only concrete achievement of that has been the, and maybe this is a big achievement, probably is, is the conclusion of the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. It's a trade agreement. It's a trade agreement that involves all, almost all of the East Asian countries with the exception of China. It also involves Canada, um, the U.S., of course, Mexico, and I think uh, Chile. So it's a, a Pacific... Uh, oh, and Vietnam is one of the countries, too. So that was concluded, and again, that's a very technical and very difficult uh, achievement diplomatically. And it now uh, will seems like it's going to get confirmed in the U.S. legislature, which is not easy to do. With respect to Europe, which is the area I'm sure you're most interested in, we have the Ukraine crisis. Uh, on this, uh, I don't know if you would acknowledge it's a success or not, but it is the case that the U.S., I think, has been able to um, insist upon the imposition of sanctions on Russia, and possibly the U.S. involvement has been uh, part of the reason why there's been a cohesion, cohesive approach in, within the European Union with respect to the problem in Ukraine. I, I don't know. Um, some people would definitely say that that wasn't adequate, but it, it says it's success in any case. Okay, so those, uh, that's, his, uh, that's his report card. Now look, that's what he looks like eight years after being president. I mean, I don't think he looks terrible, but you can definitely see that it's a very hard job, and it's very, very trying. So, uh, so now, but as I say, many of the, on the Republican side, the whole race, even though they don't say anything about it, or they don't say, mention him that often, but definitely, it's really about him and about his record on the Republican side. Okay, so who are the Republican candidates? Okay, uh, do you know them all? You do? Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, this isn't even all of them. You know, it's a very crowded field this year, and so there's like a second table, like the children's table or something for the people who don't uh, get more than, say, 2% or something in the polling. So uh, there's other people, but we won't bother with them uh, at this point, I think. My guess is that the nominee will be one of these people. Okay, so less well, of course, we have the leader uh, in the polls, uh, Donald Trump. We have... The second in the polls now, Cruz, Ted Cruz, a senator from uh, Texas. The third in the polls, uh, Marco Rubio, a senator from uh, Florida. And then, uh, oh, I think Ben Carson is still in there, maybe the next level. And then probably Jeb Bush, the son of the former president, George H.W. Uh, Bush, and of course the brother of George W. Bush. He was the one upon, that the establishment uh, really thought would have the most, most chance of victory. He's not been doing that well. This is the governor of, uh, of New Jersey, Chris Christie. And this is the governor of Ohio, uh, John Kasich. And so this, is, uh, this was at their most recent debate. They've had, I think, six debates already. It's a really quite a, a whirlwind of debating that they have been doing. And so that's uh, the group. The group, the debates have been very frequent. I think they've attracted a lot of viewers. And I think definitely one reason they have is because of this gentleman and his uh, somewhat outrageous uh, remarks at times. Unfortunately, I think that it's fair to say that I told you before that one issue in the campaign is always just leadership and quality, quick thinking, uh, uh, ability to think on your feet and so on. Well, these, this is the practically the only only content of this whole uh, debate has been about you know, who deals best with just the give and take of mutual insult or something like that. There's a lot of uh, personal jobs that each one is aiming at the other one. So there hasn't been that much of great uh, substance in a lot of the debate. 
Now, on the Democratic side, oh, yes, talking about foreign policy. Foreign and security policy, it is important to the voters in the Republican primaries. Interestingly enough, Republican primary voters are 15 percentage points more likely than Democrats to consider terrorism very important, and 12 points more likely than to view foreign, po that, to view foreign policy as important. So this does explain in the debate there is a fair amount of discussion, especially about ISIS, about terrorism, so on. Okay. So uh, in the Republican side. Okay. All right, the Democratic side. The prohibitive favorite, of course, Hillary Clinton. Her challenger, Bernie Sanders, from um, Senator from uh, Vermont, is uh, uh, to her left, I mean, physically and, and in every sense. So he's uh, challenging her more from the left. This is the governor, former governor of Maryland, Martin O'Malley. He is uh, really, uh, I think, will soon drop out. I mean, he doesn't have enough. Uh, support now, but uh, the, these debates have been much less frequent, and many people, conspiracy theorists are saying, oh, it's because they don't want any chance for Hillary to not present herself well, because they know that she will be the nominee. And so the De Democratic National Committee is scheduling them on Saturday night when no one is going to watch it, and also, you know, Sunday night and things like that. But in the most recent one, which I think this was the most recent one, Bernie Sanders gave her a fairly hard time, and, uh, but, but it's still it's gentle compared to the Republican side, much more gentle. And much more substantive, too, in terms of, the, of the, what they actually are talking about. So that's, uh, that's it. Okay, here's uh, how the primaries work. Uh, so, which state is going to be the first to decide? Who can tell me that? Iowa. Iowa. Okay, you guys know this. So, Iowa is here. Okay. And then immediately after Iowa, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Very good. Exactly. So, yes, and it's just, you might ask yourself, why? Why Iowa? Why New Hampshire? Well, New Hampshire, ever since I was a little, little girl, has always had the first primary. Always. And a few years ago, maybe it's been maybe even as much as 20 years ago, I guess Iowa decided to jump forward so they could get some of that same attention. Okay, both of these states are very small. I mean, the populations are small. Iowa doesn't look that small, but it's a rural state and it's, it's really a small population. And New Hampshire is a small population too. So in both of these places, they have what they call People like to call it retail politics. In other words, these candidates are going out and talking to people like at a shopping mall, maybe something like 150 people or something like that. And, you know, really people get a chance to question them and to, you know, maybe they'll be at a church or they could be, you know, a uh, different place, a school, things like that. It's just kind of like what we are here. So it might be about a group like this. So people get to really have a chance to see what these people are about. But the thing to understand is that the Iowa and the New Hampshire contest, but especially the Iowa contest, are not really that representative of the United States because the Iowa electorate, the Republican electorate in Ohio, I'm sorry, in uh, Iowa, is um, quite a bit more conservative than the average Republican electorate in the United States, and in particular, more evangelical, evangelical Christian. So, uh, and the Democratic side, also Iowa, tends to be more liberal than the uh, than more liberal than the average, in other words, more to the left. So, so right now, who's the leader in the poll in, in the Iowa? Okay, good, at least I know something you guys think. Cruz is actually leading, by right? just a little bit, Cruz, okay? But he's really almost neck and neck with uh, Trump, okay? And, who, and Sanders is leading in Iowa, and he's leading in New Hampshire as well. So it now seems that Hillary Clinton won't necessarily have just like a coronation. In other words, she will have to uh, fight. And she seems good at that, so maybe she'll succeed. But anyway, it's not going to be that easy. But um, she is um, lucky in Sanders because Sanders is very, um, I think, the people say he's a gentleman. He doesn't sort of try to bring up a very, uh, potentially damaging things. And also, oh, Sanders is not interested in foreign policy very much, really. 
Sanders' main theme is economic inequality, opportunity, and above all, he is very angry about the fact that the U.S. banking system, the big Wall Street banks, uh, emerged virtually unscathed and unpunished from the major financial crisis of 2008-2009. So he's a big advocate of a massive restructuring of the banking system and reducing the size, cutting really the big banks down to size. So it's economic, uh, um, we call it populism, I don't know, you might call it kind of almost a socialist argument. So uh, that's, that's the contest, uh, that's the ground on which Sanders is competing with, with Clinton. He's not competing about foreign policy. <laughs> okay, so, next. Polling data on the Republican side. Since the Republican side is more interesting, so you can see, this is from a site called Real Clear Politics. You can see that Trump's 34.5% uh, on the average of these polls. This is recent. So, and Cruz uh, behind him, but quite a distance behind. This is across all Republican voters, not to do with Iowa, where Cruz is actually, I think, in the lead slightly. <coughs> but the thing to realize about this is that if you take the, the, the candidates who are, I would call, establishment candidates on the Republican side, like mainstream candidates, I wouldn't really count Cruz, but you could have Rubio, Bush, Christie, Kasich, at least. That's going to easily equal, probably exceed, uh, Trump. So at some point there will be a coalescing of the mainstream electorate on one of these candidates and that will hopefully happen before too long and then you'll see a better contest. Right now though, Trump has held his lead very well. So, uh, also remember the primary voters in Republican ca uh, primaries are way much more to the right than the actual general electorate. So even if you win in the Republican primary, you're going to have, if Trump were to win, for example, he would have real trouble in the general election. So here's, here's some information to take home about this. Is that uh, right now, <coughs> uh, President Obama is not on this list, but I'll tell you, President Obama's approval rating right now is 46%. And his, oh, that's what you call a favorable opinion. So he's got a 46% favorable and a 47% negative. So he's negative one on this. Uh, but on foreign policy, only 34% of the people polled think he's doing a good job. So I think this shows that there's an opportunity for the Republican candidates to emphasize this. And that's why part of the reason they're doing that. So, and they're doing that with some success. So anyway, <clears throat> what I'd like you to look at now though, just to take this home because you hear so much about the Donald Trump, is that 91% of the people have an opinion about him, 32% of them are positive, and 59% of them are negative. So that's a negative 27. So this means, if you look here, well, Jeb Bush is, unfortunately for him, also has a big negative. But uh, there's no comparison between, uh, in terms of that negative, uh, uh, the, the numbers of people having a negative opinion or an unfavorable opinion are way in excess of any other person. And this, I think, is part of the reason why the Republican establishment, the mainstream of the party and the leadership of it, are so nervous about this. Because it's quite evident, unless there's some form of major earthquake in the United States, there's no way that he would ever win in the general election. The negatives are way too high. So this is, they're now trying desperately to figure out how to get him out of the picture. So when the president gave his talk the other night, uh, his State of the Union address, at the end of the address, always, a Republican gives an answer, a reply. <coughs> And this time it was done by the governor of, of South Carolina, Nikki Haley. She is a board of parents from India, Sikh, Sikh parentage. And she gave a very eloquent speech about how it's very important that America preserve its, its values and its, uh, you know, its previous uh, identification with the idea of welcoming uh, 
people from other places and understanding diversity and cultural and religious diversity and so on. So she, the Republican reply, was really more of a rebuttal of Trump than it was a rebuttal of Obama. So I think this was very interesting to see. And of course Obama's speech, he never mentioned Trump, but it was quite evident that he had in mind also to rebut some of the arguments that Trump had been making. Okay. All right. Okay, so on foreign policy, uh, will the foreign policy determine the outcome of the election and would foreign policy change if, uh, if uh, as a result of the election? Well, I, I would argue that really you analyze the people, both on the Republican and, and, and uh, Democratic side, you see that there's sort of in America, there's something like, uh, I would call like a mainstream of foreign policy thinking. I'm calling it like the establishment. And uh, so I put all these people, Clinton, Bush, Kasich, and Christie, all of these people, these four here I'd consider to be really in the mainstream of the mainstream. In other words, kind of centrist in terms of their outlook on all kinds of foreign policy questions. Uh, Rubio and Cruz are, uh, Rubio is a little bit more to the right. In other words, uh, do you know the expression hawk, hawks and doves, right? So Rubio is more hawkish. And he, I can tell you more about it, but he's a little bit more interventionist even than these people. And he might, it's hard to tell what he would do in office, but uh, he has some advisors who were very close to George W. Bush and are still, I think, would argue that the Iraq war was a good idea and, and so on. So, so he, he's in the establishment, but on the sort of neoconservative side. Cruz is a little bit of a wild card. He doesn't, uh, he said some things in his uh, remarks about foreign policy to suggest that he doesn't really think that it was a great idea to overthrow Gaddafi. He also has said that he thinks that Assad is bad, but he's not nearly so bad as ISIS. In other words, maybe we should just put up with Assad and try to deal with ISIS. So he doesn't seem to be a conventionally a hawkish uh, person on uh, military interventions overseas. But he's very, very tough on uh, national oh no, immigration and, and questions like that. In other words, the, the uh, defense of the homeland, as it's called. So. Um, so that's Cruz. <clears throat> and then these are people that I would consider to be outside of the usual establishment, kind of the same way. Trump is a very peculiar character. We'll talk about it more. Carson really isn't all that knowledgeable about foreign policy. And Sanders, um, he was governor of Vermont. No, was he governor or mayor of Burlington? Anyway, he, in Vermont, he was always very much on you know, anti-poverty and helping uh, poor in Africa and, you know, this sort of developmental and environmental issue. But other than that, I don't think he really has that much of a foreign policy orientation. It's just not something he's that interested in. So, so that's the picture in the big picture. Okay, so there's Trump. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of epitomizes Trump in my mind. He's sort of like, yeah, what the hell, you know, why don't we just do something different? <laughs> and so, I think one of the reasons why he is so popular is, I think you've seen this in Poland, I know there have been various candidates that people really like because they're just saying something like, no one else would dare to say that, you know, and so people are just like, yes. <laughs> so because people get kind of tired of hearing sort of like things that sound very rehearsed and they sound kind of cautious and they're mealy-mouthed, if you know what I mean, like equivocal, they're not, you know. So he is definitely introducing a kind of a rhetorical, uh, I don't know, kind of uh, more, uh, I guess, natural or populist uh, element in the discussion. And it is true, very much so, that his, um, his, uh, some of his remarks do address uh, foreign policy. But I forgot to tell you before, I was going to say when I was talking about the establishment in foreign policy of the mainstream, as I said, you know, in the actual debates and discussions, we don't learn very much about what they would do in foreign policy. But I'm going to show you, at least I give you an inkling. I did a little research on who their advisors are, and I 
I think that you can discern when you look at that a little bit about what is the establishment in the United States, that it's not a bad thing, it's actually kind of a good thing. Basically, the people that are drawn upon are people who come from like three or four milieu. One of them is universities, above all the Ivy League universities, Yale University and Harvard University in particular. Law firms, law firms in Washington that are involved in any kind of foreign trade or investment policy, they have always to understand political risk and so on, so they're people with that expertise. Think tanks like the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, you know, many others that we have in Washington. And finally, almost all of these people have been in government before, these advisors. They've been in government before in different capacities as advisors. Uh, sometimes they've worked in Capitol Hill as an advisor to a senator. Sometimes they've worked uh, in, a, um, uh, in the administration. For example, in the State Department, there's an office called the um, Policy Planning Staff. And actually, I'm very proud to say I served there for a brief time, but it always is a sort of an intellectual kind of a in-house think tank for the State Secretary of State to sort of strategize about, okay, how can we solve <laughs> A particular problem. So a lot of times people are from there. So this is the type of people that we we'll, that are advising at least the mainstream candidates. And that's why I'm telling you when 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 we have a result, it could well be that we won't see a major change in foreign policy because America has. I think it's a good thing. Again, is a certain uh, depth of kind of expertise that sits on the bench a lot during the, say, when there's a Democrat who's a president, a lot of these people are going back to their institutions, their universities, and then they will come back if a Republican is uh, victorious, or the other way around. So that's the, that's why when you look at U.S. foreign policy from the end of the war till now, end of the Second World War till now, at least there's not a vast amount of difference. So, but yes, Trump, this is a little different with Trump. Trump has asked, has asked, been asked repeatedly on the campaign trail, well, who are your foreign policy advisors? And he says, oh, I've got some really good people and I'm going to be unveiling that soon. You're going to be so surprised. You're going to be so impressed. He says, I was looking at the press. He's been saying that since November and no one has had any notion of who are these advisors. So I think it's going to be interesting. So somebody said, well, how do you figure out what your positions are? And he says, I watch the Sunday talk shows on the television. And then he's friendly with a lot of people in business, and I guess, you know, he just trusts his own instincts. But clearly, you can tell, he doesn't really know a tremendous amount about uh, the subject. So, so this is an issue. That sets him apart from the others. But when I said before he likes to say things that are, you know, uh, challenging political correctness, well, some of the things that he has said, of course, well, initially his popularity got uh, launched, from saying very impolite things about Mexican immigrants, like most of them are rapists and criminals or something like that. And then after that he said, and many of them are saying, many of the Republicans are saying, saying, why doesn't the president refer to ISIS and groups like that as Islamist or Islamic uh, uh, extremist or Islamic terrorist? And we can discuss, if you like, why the president doesn't do that, but that's that's considered to be like cowardly, like you're not calling a thing by its name. So that's what they're trying to say. And then finally, of course, he got a tremendous push and said that uh, after the Paris attacks in November, and then after the even worse, the San Bernardino attacks in California on December 2nd, uh, there's a, a, a rise in public anxiety about the dangers of this type of terrorist attack in the United States. And, of course, you all know that his uh, proposed solution, at least part of it, would be for the time being to not allow any Muslim to enter the United States on it at all. Okay, so that is the sort of, uh, sort of thing which is, uh, again, we, I said foreign policy isn't very present in the, uh, in the uh, campaign, but it's present, but it's in present in a very, that's what I would call uh, inflammatory, you know, and not very informative uh, way of talking about problem solving in the in the air in the in the uh, in the issue, the broad issue of, of Islam or uh, extremism in the Middle East. So, 
But I, I think, uh, as I said before, I think people just love to watch him because it's like watching somebody on a high wire. I mean, eventually he will say something that's just like really going to disqualify him. But everyone is waiting. Like in the first debate, he said something to one of the women uh, interviewers that implied that he thought she was having, you know, some sort of pre menstrual syndrome or something like that. That was very, very rude, you know. So he just doesn't, uh, he never, he's not afraid to say anything, and it seems like it hasn't hurt him so far. Okay, so going on to the next people, Cruz. Well, Ted Cruz is, is nearly as conservative as, uh, as, as, well, actually, come back here. Trump is only apparently conservative, really, on a lot of issues about foreign policy, you know, to the extent we can glean anything about what he thinks is that he's very tough about the notion of protecting Americans from terrorism and doing anything, including killing the, w the wives and children of the ter suspected terrorists. But when asked about, like, for example, toppling Saddam Hussein in 2003, he didn't think it was a good idea. He doesn't think this getting involved in Syria would be a good idea. And moreover, I'm, maybe quite a few of you know this because I know in Poland you keep a close eye, but he also said he figured he could make a deal with Putin. He and Putin could certainly get along, you know, if, if he gets in, he'll sort it out with Putin. And not in a, an aggressive way, rather, you know, I'll come to an understanding. Well, when Putin recently gave his press conference, he said, uh, he said some nice things about Donald Trump, so that's uh, also a, a matter of concern, I suppose. So that's outside the mainstream of foreign policy, that's what I would say. So, Cruz. Cruz, uh, as I told you before, is uh, not, um, not got a, he has some advisors, but um, not anybody that's really very well known. And I think, I, I was trying to figure out why, because he now does seem, he's sort of an establishment figure, he's a senator from Texas. But he doesn't, he doesn't have much, uh, you know, a, a serious staff of advisors. And I'm thinking it might be because, as you all probably know, maybe this is not a good reason, but he is born, born in Canada. And the U.S. Constitution says that the president must be natural born. And it's not clear exactly, you know, how to construe that term. And he is a graduate of Harvard Law School and brilliant, brilliant, you know, lawyer. And he says, no, I'm fine, it's natural born, my mother is American. But it's not clear, and so that, that, could, be, that could be an issue. So moreover, he is, um, anyway, if he does win in Iowa, you might see him becoming more, uh, developing a little bit more of a policy staff on, on, on foreign policy. Uh, he's of Cuban origin, just as Marco Rubio is. And, People who are, uh, whose parents were disenfranchised by Castro's regime or parents or grandparents, they tend to be quite tough on foreign policy and they're not happy at all about the rapprochement with Cuba, which another one of uh, Barack Obama's successes, I forgot to even mention it, but that's a huge uh, success as well. They don't see it that way, but anyway. So that is Cruz. So now moving along to Rubio. I told you, Rubio, as you can see, uh, um, very genial, kind of the opposite of Cruz. They're both of, of origin of, of, uh, of, of uh, they're both of Florida, no, that's not true, they're both of Cuban origin. But uh, Rubio is much more uh, genial, friendly kind of a person. Anyway, but I discovered that it seems that a lot of the staff that did foreign policy in the time of George W. Bush, and who consider you know, that they were on the right course to make a very strong stand, for example, in uh, Iraq, and also do not want to deal with Iran, would like to take a much tougher stance on Iran. A lot of those people have gravitated to the staff of Rubio, including this, I learned about this group, it's called the John Hay Initiative. It's a group of 250 people with a good, with very deep uh, defense and foreign policy expertise, experts, including Elliot Cohen, who's a leader of the Strategic Studies Program at the place where I got my PhD, and that's Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He's uh, one of the leaders. Eric Edelman was a career foreign service officer, but also has, uh, uh, you know, uh, his uh, personal opinions and so on are very much are those of the, you know, the George, George the Rumsfeld, uh, George W. Bush uh, school. 
I'm not even sure about this uh, book, but I gather that they're all, I mean, what his background is, but I, this is apparently a kind of a brain trust for Rubio. So now Rubio really has some serious expertise behind him. Not a, it's not expertise I necessarily, you know, that uh, close to in terms of my, their outlook, but certainly these people are very respected experts. Oh, and this is another respected expert, Robert Kagan, one of the best known of the uh, so-called neoconservatives in America. He's a very, very articulate, very brilliant guy. He's uh, uh, been in the Carnegie Endowment. He's written a lot of books. And his, he's married to Victoria Newland, who is the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary for European Affairs, European Eurasian Affairs in the State Department. It's in the news quite a lot. So that's his wife. So he is supposedly advising Rubio. So this is quite important. Then we get to Jeb Bush. Now Jeb Bush probably has the, and Jeb Bush along with Hillary Clinton, they've been the richest and most deep, uh, numerous, and well, you know, very well qualified uh, advisory staffs. And so here's a very interesting picture of what I found that uh, shows about Bush's advisors. The way this is is that these, this circle here is people that were advisors uh, involved with uh, George H.W. Bush. This circle here is people reaching back to Reagan's time. And then there's overlap, as you see. And then people from his brother's uh, administration, uh, some of them overlapping. So it's a very, very impressive bunch of people. This is the, the former president of the World Bank, the National, Secu uh, National Security Advisor during uh, uh, Bush's second, second term of Bush. Uh, this is a career diplomat, served in many places, fantastic. Uh, the former State Department, Secretary of State, former Secretary of State. Uh, this was the, uh, he was the uh, Attorney General in Bush's administration, uh, Bush, George W., Director of the CIA, Homeland Security. So it's a hugely, hugely impressive group of people. And one of them, one of them, uh, I gather, is I had read that she was actually directing the work. I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I heard that. This is Megan O'Sullivan. She is, as you see, pretty, pretty young, very impressive resume. She's a professor at Harvard uh, at the Kennedy School. And she was involved in the, not in the launch of the Iraq War, but in the second term of Bush, uh, George W. Bush. As you all probably know, in the first term, it was very much a, a kind of a neoconservative, uh, almost lock on the foreign policy in the first term. In the second term, Bush tried to modulate away more to a mainstream, a Republican approach. And most of the people that are on the staff are people from that second term. So that's what I, and she's one of these people. And she is very, <coughs> so she's a specialist on the Middle East, but not only. And in the State Department, she worked on the devising uh, ideas about sanctions that she worked with Colin Powell when he was secretary. So she's a very a brilliant person. So now getting to the last, the last bit is we have Secretary Clinton. I didn't get her picture by herself because I, as you can see, they, they get along okay, I think. <laughs> okay, well she has probably, of all the people, she has a record on foreign affairs. And that is, makes her both more interesting as a candidate, but potentially more vulnerable as a candidate as well. Because she is trying to walk the line between advocating continue, continuity with Obama, because after all, she was the Secretary of State in his first term. But at the same time, at least try, she doesn't want to in any way diss or undermine President Obama, but she needs to distinguish herself a little bit from him in order to uh, be... Um, Let's just put it this way. I think that the, the electorate is looking for change. And if she seems to be the same thing, she's really going to have a problem. So she's seeking a, some sort of a ground where she can at least distinguish herself. So what do we know about how different she would be? Uh, we know from the record, for example, on the home crisis in Egypt, to her square and so on, apparently she never favored uh, abandoning Mubarak. She would have preferred to just stick with Mubarak and try to try to uh, lead some sort of reforms that would uh, ensure more continuity. So that was one thing. 
she supported bombing Libya. This is probably not her finest hour. Now, apparently Obama was not so much in favor of that. And I think if you're going to look at failures of the Obama administration, I, and it's not Obama administration alone, it's Europe as well, the operation in Libya, I think you'd have to say it's very hard to argue that it's produced an outcome that's better than what the status quo ante was. Because now there's a virtually a anarchy and, uh, and, uh, and now ISIS and other extremists have been able to set, settle there and it's generated a massive amount of migration into Europe. So, uh, so along Libya and Syria would both be potentially mistakes. So, she was in favor of the pivot to China. We talked about that before. Not so much happened, but at least this uh, big trading agreement is, is, is an achievement. She was tougher on Palestinians and, and Iran than, than Clinton was, and closer to Israel. She favored ar ar arming the opposition in Syria. <coughs> there were other people in the administration who did as well. And you know, you probably know that Obama has never wholeheartedly supported that. There's been a very gradual and very limited uh, support for the opposition in Syria. Um, she was somewhat skeptical on the reset with Russia. She's very, uh, she's got a lot of experience now on anything to do with military because of her Armed Services Committee as, uh, role in the Senate and she was very well respected and very well informed on these issues. She is, I would say, she is more traditional and mainstream, really, than Obama. Obama lies a little bit to the left of the mainstream in American foreign policy. So if she were elected, it would probably be uh, a return to something you'd recognize as more the second Bush administration or the, the, Mr. the Bush the Elder administration. So more uh, the notion that there's nothing old-fashioned about the idea of U.S. leadership. That's her idea. Her idea is that this is... Um, this is what we need to do. So, and geopolitical competition matters. But she has a huge vulnerability, which is this Benghazi attack, which I, you know, you probably know that she was blamed because she was a Secretary of State. She was blamed for the failure of security and intelligence that produced the outcome in Benghazi, where our ambassador and I think three others were killed in uh, September 11th of 2012. And I'm sure that if she's a nominee, which I believe she'll be. There'll be a, whoever the Republican is will try to use this still, even though, frankly, it's been, it's a bit, uh, it's been exploited a lot already and without any great result. Oh, oh yes, and this is her principal advisor, Jake Sullivan. He will probably be, they say, is likely to be the uh, national security advisor. Um, I know I must be encouraging you all of you. He seems like somebody who could be my grandson or something at this point. But he is a brilliant young man who has a, a Yale law degree, just as Hillary Clinton has a Yale law degree. And also served in, uh, got his PhD at Oxford, just as her husband did, um, Bill Clinton. So um, he uh, has just an incredibly impressive uh, uh, resume and uh, has a, uh, served in government in different capacities, including the policy planning staff. So I'm anticipating, we don't see much of him, but that is the person who's, I guess, orchestrating the, uh, all of her foreign policy advice. advice. So, so looking back at this, I just, I think that you can see that, for example, Hillary Clinton, 94% of the people know who she is, and they're slightly more unfavorable than favorable, so that could be a problem, I suppose. But it just depends on who she is up against. As you can see here, uh, Jeb Bush would also have a big hole to climb out of. And uh, the others, some of these others we've talked about aren't even that known to the public yet. But it is true, if we look at Rubio here, maybe he does have some potential because he at least is, to the extent people know him, they like him. Whereas Cruz, to the extent people know him, they don't like him. Not, not to a great degree, but to some extent. So anyway, so I hope I've uh, helped you at least to think about a little bit what might be at stake in the, in the election and, uh, and how foreign policy might matter. So I would be really happy if any of you would you know, give me an idea about how you see it, for example, uh, how, uh, uh, how, how you think uh, the election might affect, uh, for example, 
the interest in Poland, if you want to ask me that, or any question you have for me, I'd be very happy to, to have, have a question for you. Yes. Uh, I don't know, because I, I didn't really follow it too closely, but I think there was a scandal with Hillary Clinton regarding some emails in the State Department, and the fact that apparently the, the Clinton Foundation got a lot of foreign donations uh, that were undisclosed, and that seemed to be pretty big some months ago, but it doesn't seem to catch, I mean, it doesn't seem to, to be an nowadays, but do you think that that might be an argument that could be used against her? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I re remember and I've read a fair amount about it. I think that she has argued that, that um, for example, it's not so much that the Clinton Foundation can't get foreign um, donors. They, of course they can. But the question was whether a foreign donor like Qatar or some big uh, Arab state like that, maybe there was a quid pro quo and something that was done for them. But uh, I think that it's never been shown that there was. But it was a big issue, and I would expect that it could come back. The not ju not just the uh, the uh, emails are an issue kind of on their own, kind of interesting. But uh, but the um, but the um, the Clinton Foundation, well, I would say the following is that I meant to say before is that there, you know, as I said, the election isn't only about those people participating. There's like a presiding spirit, which is Barack Obama and whether he was a good president, right? But when Barack Obama was elected, of course, the presiding spirit was uh, George W. Bush and whether he was a good president, which everybody kind of thought probably not by that time. So, anyway. I think you're absolutely right that Bill Clinton will be there as a liability for her, in a way. I mean, even though he is now, his positives, you know, favorable versus unfavorable, he's got very strong favorable in, in American public opinion now. But I think that might be because there's a kind of a glow, you know, that's a long time since he was a president. So I think that if these things are raised, that it could be, it could be a problem. On the other hand, I. Another problem for her is that the Clinton Foundation and really her donor base, she has more money by far than anybody on the Democratic side. She and Jeb Bush are the best financed of the, two, of, the, of, the, of the race. And they have not the same supporters, obviously, but a lot of people in mainstream business, people with a lot of success in business. And in her case, it's been alleged that she gets a lot of, uh, has had a fair amount of support from the Wall Street banks, uh, including like Goldman Sachs and things like that. So Bernie Sanders attacks her on that, uh, uh, on that, uh, on that. So it would depend on the Republican candidate. I can hardly imagine Jeb Bush trying to attack her on that, since he is pretty much the same in terms of uh, his uh, supporters. But Trump. Trump's, he will never be nominated, but let's just say one of the things that Trump says is that, look, I'm rich, I don't need any money from anybody else, so, you know, so I'm not taking any donations, so what I say, what you see is what you get, nobody's paying me, you know, so, uh, so if, if you get somebody who is more, uh, uh, who doesn't have such a big business backing, yeah, maybe they could come up, and uh, maybe Rubio would bring something like that up, it's hard to tell, but on, on the, uh, the, mail, the emails, there was an issue about their classification, in other words, that there's issues that are maybe were secret or whatever, but that seems to have gone away now, because she never initiated any secret things. Somebody may have sent her inadvertently something, and that's not her fault. But one thing about it is the emails seem to be very, they're very casual, you know, they're very personal. Like, you know, you might talk to a good colleague, like, oh, what a jerk so-and-so is, and so on. This is embarrassing. So. Uh, when the most recent uh, uh, hearings that were held on Benghazi, that's all anybody talked about was conversation she had on her email with friends who were saying things about uh, about uh, the situation in Libya and so on. And it was some of it was it was not substantively wrong, but it was just not it was sort of embarrassing. Maybe it's a little bit like you know here in Poland you have that event with those tapes in that restaurant. Well, it's a little like that. When people are sitting around, they think they're talking with a friend, and they're being very, you know, rude, maybe. And it doesn't look good on a, uh, you know, when somebody, the public reads it, sort of like that. So it could come out. That could be a problem. So 
What else? Is there anything that concerns you all about the election? I mean, do you think that there's a danger or a risk or any kind of a disadvantage? Uh, is there anything that is either an opportunity or a danger from the standpoint of your country in terms of what may happen? Uh, just, uh, if I may, a question. Uh, okay. More of an academic nature, not to <laughs> your thinking about your questions. Uh -huh. um, Good. Is there any, uh, as someone who follows foreign policy issues in American politics, would you say that it's fair to say that interest in foreign policy is regional? That there are regions, areas in the United States where there is greater interest in foreign policy as, a, as an issue? and areas where there is lesser, you know, the, the typical thinking about the Midwest and they, they don't care about foreign policy. <coughs> Maybe on both coasts, uh, coastal lines, there is more interest. Is it true? Do you find support for, for this? Or well, is this low interest in foreign policy like spread out through the whole country without you being able to pinpoint areas or groups? Or, or, or age groups that would be interested more in foreign policy for which for whom foreign policy would matter more than for others? <coughs> well, it used to be popular to talk about the Eastern establishment in, uh, in thinking about uh, foreign policy. And what that meant was Boston and New York in particular. And uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, for example, which is probably the most uh, prestigious uh, think tank uh, and um, um, was, is very much a product of a New York uh, um, kind of in intelligentsia, I suppose, based in New York. So traditionally, especially in the post-war period, you know, the State Department used to be peopled almost exclusively by uh, men who had a degree from either Harvard or Yale or Princeton. That was back in the immediate post-war period. So definitely there is a concentration of sort of brain power and um, a institutional kind of um, institutions having, you know, a long, you know, um, uh, long experience in formulated policy are located on the East Coast and then New York and Boston and now Washington as well. Uh, so, so I think, uh, for example, I showed you the Megan O'Sullivan from Harvard and the Jake Sullivan and Jake Sullivan. Hey, they're not related anyway. From uh, from uh, from uh, Yale. So I don't think that's atypical. <laughs> so, but um, I would also say this is, may sound terrible to you, but I just do think that it's uh, if you look across the whole United States, it's that it, the interest in it is very highly correlated with the level of education, really. Because the more people have uh, uh, education and the more they have uh, professions which are bringing them into contact with the world, the more they begin to care about this. And so that's true in Texas, where I'm from, or it's true in Iowa, I'm sure, as well, as the universities and so on, and some of the companies, maybe. Iowa's a big agricultural exporter, so I'm sure they care about some aspects of foreign policy, you know. It's very important, you know, uh, export markets for uh, American agriculture. So. Um, there are parochial, not parochial, but sort of special interests, like Texas is very interested in relation to Latin America. And California is very interested in relation with Asia. So, uh, so there are specialized interests like that. But as far as like the people who strategize about America's role in the world, I would say it's still very concentrated on the East Coast. Yeah. So, so are you happy with the idea that the U.S. has got a sort of a are there troubles that you have about U.S. foreign policy? Is there anything you'd like to see changed? Or what do you think about the Obama record? Do any of you have thoughts about that? Yes. Uh, I'm kind of wondering about uh, the most likely change in Syria policy after the election, because something will probably have to change, right? The approach that the Obama administration has so far isn't really doing anything. So whoever is going to be elected will have to feel respons the responsibility to change something. What do you think would be the most likely change, and in which direction would that go? You know what? I don't really think it will change very much, if, unless, uh, of course, unless I guess if I'm correct that Rubio's advisors are are, are more um, more uh, hawkish, then 
I could see someone like Rubio deciding as president that we need to really, really radically modify our approach and that would involve um, both trying to get rid of Assad and trying to confront ISIS. And that would almost certainly involve some form of ground force uh, in, uh, inserted into, into uh, Syria, uh, American or possibly a regional one. But to be honest with you, I don't think that would have very much popular support. <laughs> I think if somebody advocates that now, I don't think that that will get them uh, elected. Because I think that Americans, even now, even with all the threat that they feel, and most of the tough rhetoric about Syria, like for example, Ted Cruz said he would carpet bomb ISIS. Okay, well, fine, that sounds tough, but it doesn't involve putting American troops there. So even the tough people are not really talking about putting American troops there. And so if you're not going to put American troops there, you have to then find another ground force that could, you could introduce, and that no one can think of any. You know, I mean, there's the Kurds. But that's probably not adequate. What you would really need is somebody, some force that would emerge from within the Sunni population that would be both reliably not extremist and strong enough to make a difference. And this has been the problem from the very beginning. That's why Obama never really liked the idea of intervening, because there was no such, no such force. People argued that there was, but there didn't really, and maybe there was. Maybe at some early phase, if the intervention had happened and been more coherent, then maybe it could have been. It's hard to say. It's a counterfactual. But at this stage, I don't see it. Personally, I don't see it. So I don't really think there will be a major change, which I do think could happen. Maybe, maybe I'm just being hopeful, but you know, I do think that now the international community has begun to understand that this is an unacceptable level of danger for European security, for example. Turkey is now being attacked by ISIS. So I think that people, there might be enough of a, of a consensus to really put this Assad question aside for a while and just try to focus on the ISIS question and try to eliminate it through a combination of just air attacks and I guess some kind of ultimately some form of Sunni alternative uh, leadership. And, and this could be done through the diplomatic process. You know the diplomatic process is actually making some headway now. There's going to be, I, I think in the very near future, a meeting um, uh, with Kerry and Lavrov and everybody else, so Turks and the Iranians. On the other hand, speaking of that, you know that Iran and Saudi Arabia are now very much loggerheads. So now it may be impossible because it seems like the deal that could be done needs them both to come to terms with, yeah, you know, modifying their maximum expectation and making a compromise. And I'm not sure that can happen. But anyway, I don't, I don't really think anybody has any great ideas about how to fix Syria. So I don't really think it will change very much. I, uh, there might be more toughness about the Russians possibly, you know, trying to urge them to do something different. But. I don't know how that will very good. Anyway, so I expected you all to ask me about Ukraine or Poland or whatever, but, well. Okay, I have a question. Yes. Um, I have this friend, and he's, his whole life has been Republican, moderate Republican. And I talked to him recently, and he said that he actually started reading uh, what Kenny said, and he likes Bernie Sanders, my great surprise. Really? And he said something very interesting from my perspective, because he said that one thing that worries him about Bernie Sanders is his foreign policy uh, stance, that he wouldn't be tough enough, we live in a very dangerous environment, dangerous times now, and Bernie Sanders does not, so weak, does not seem to be the right guy for a, the job to handle like, a tough job like this. And there is, I think, like a traditional thinking that the more left liberal you are, the worse you are, into, not, not worse, but the less tough you are in foreign policy. So how do you think would that work in, in terms of Democrats? I mean, uh, that we live in this general, very tough, hard environment, full of danger, and how would that, like, naturally favor Republicans who tend to be more uh, tend to be more active, tend to be more um, responsive to, to challenges in a more substantial way? Well, you know, I, I I think that it's the case, and I meant to mention this before. I showed you that Republican voters at the, in the primaries care more about uh, terrorism and foreign policy. So that's true, then de Democrats do. Well, they care in the sense, I think they think there's more pressing danger. They see the world as more 
much more dangerous and potentially even dangerous to their own personal security. So uh, whereas Democrats uh, voters don't don't give that as much um, emphasis. They they seem to be more interested in the social uh, uh, social and economic uh, policies even now. But when you really look at the record of foreign policy as it has been carried out from the from the from say Roosevelt's administration to the current day, I, I don't think it's really the case that Democrats as a group tended to be uh, less tough. I think Kennedy, for example, was very, very, very tough. As tough, you know, as, as uh, assertive of American uh, leadership as uh, say Eisenhower was. Uh, probably uh, Clinton also. I think Clinton, uh, you know, has a has a very strong record on foreign policy. But he had a very bad example of Carter, for example. Carter is probably the counterexample. And Carter, I mean, I have a great fondness for him. I think he's one of the, you know, the finest human beings probably that's ever been a president. But uh, maybe that isn't what you need in every case. He does a, I think Bernie Sanders would probably be similar. But you know, actually Carter did make one very good decision. I think you all uh, here uh, <laughs> in Poland will agree in choosing uh, Speaking of Jeff Brzezinski as his, uh, his uh, national security advisor, and even to this day, speaking of Brzezinski's uh, opinions and his outlook and so on are, are just incredibly valuable to the debate. And interestingly enough, between those two guys, and then say Brzezinski and Kissinger, really, we don't really need any other brain trusts. We just have those two, but unfortunately, they're getting old now. So, But in any case, uh, so I, 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 I think even in the case of Carter, he named he named Brzezinski. He took Brzezinski's advice on uh, really taking a strong stance on the Afghanistan, uh, you know, the invasion of by the Soviet Union of Afghanistan, and uh, you know, boycotted the Olympics in Moscow. You know, so I mean, he took some tough, uh, some tough decision. I think the idea of his being uh, weak is entirely related to the terrible tragedy of the Iran hostages, and we really are very much under that. Uh, that still very, very much colors the American view about the Iran deal, and the nuclear deal, and so on. It's just people do not forgive and do not forget that episode. So that's what I meant by it when I said I think that Obama is incredibly, I mean, I think that, you know, it's hard to tell whether this will stand up as a success, but he actually produced results that almost are remarkable in terms of the, uh, uh, headwinds that you had a phase to do these things to make these things work. So I was wondering who might be the foreign, uh, for the, the Secretary of State for Clinton because I did show you Jake uh, Sullivan, but you know it'll be somebody older with more experience and stuff will be the uh, Secretary of State. And somebody said, well, maybe she would name Bill Clinton the Secretary of State. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> but I, I don't know who else she would name because I don't think she's that close to a lot of the other people that are currently in the administration, like Susan Rice or, or someone like that. Maybe she would keep Kerry. I think that would be very interesting. But what I told you before about there being continuity in American foreign policy, I think this is really interesting to see is that, you know, Obama kept Robert Gates, who had been Secretary of Defense under the second term of, of Bush, he kept him as Secretary of defense into his administration. And I think this was his way of showing, look, we're not making a radical change. We're just trying to conduct American poli policy in ways that are, you know, we achieve our ends, but we don't uh, risk too much in terms of um, military uh, adventures. So there was continuity there. And apparently Hillary Clinton and Robert Gates in their mo memoirs that each has written it seems like they agreed with each other about 85% of the time. So really, uh, Hillary Clinton's outlook is not that different in terms of, if anything, it'll be closer to the Bush administration than it was to, oh, I know that's not quite right, but it'll, it'll be a little bit more like the Clinton administration, more centrist than what Obama's has been. Because Obama really does believe, I think, that we're in a kind of a post I think he at least uh, thinks that these global problems, like things like uh, climate change and nuclear nonproliferation and, and uh, he um, uh, health and development and all these kind of things, he, he really wanted those to be have more priority. And so he gave a lot of an effort to treat the world as a basically a place where there's a large uh, a sphere of cooperation.
I mean, I believe that cooperation was really the order of the day. And I think now we're seeing this is starting to come apart at the seams. I mean, there's a whole lot more competition in the global uh, sphere in terms of old-fashioned geopolitics making a comeback. So clearly, um, I think that she or whoever's elected will have to deal with a, a different situation. So anyway, I really, mm -hmm. I'm ready to take another question if anybody has one. All right, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you and for coming and being uh, uh, for the opportunity I've had to work in a very interesting country. And I wish you all kinds of success in your, in your future work. Thanks. <laughs>